Thank you. Africa is part of the One Belt, One Road initiative. At least East Africa is. But the initiative will probably affect the entire continent. And the way that Africans want One Belt, One Road uh, to affect the entire continent is through industrialization. So I'm going to look today at the question of whether Chinese investment in Africa serves to help industrialize the continent. I think the first thing you need to know about Africa in terms of industrialization is that actually it has been going backwards in recent years. That is, if you look at the proportion of GDP or the proportion of employment or um, the proportion of export, exports that involve manufactured goods in Africa, it has actually been declining over the course of the last 25 years. Uh, the reasons for that are somewhat complex. So I won't go into it. Uh, but uh, I will say this, that at the same time, this proportion is declining. Nevertheless, it is the case that there is absolute growth in terms of the manufacturing sector in Africa. Uh, on average, it's been growing about 2.5% per year. The problem with that is that a growth of 2.5% per year doesn't keep up with the rate of growth of Africa's population, which is still growing at about 3% a year. So this obviously presents some problems, and the question is, whether China can do things in Africa which will help to overcome some of those problems related to the potential for industrialization in Africa. And that, of course, relates to many aspects of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Now, there is a kind of thesis about deindustrialization in Africa. Uh, I've already given some notion of the fact that the industrialization process is, in the proportionate sense, not going forward, but is somewhat in the absolute sense. Um, the, there, is, there has been a claim that actually what China is doing in Africa is not industrializing the continent, but deindustrializing that. Uh, and this claim has been made um, not by very many people, and not by very many learned people. Uh, but it has been made and hugely publicized, at least in the Western media. Perhaps the most famous statement uh, was in an interview with the Financial Times, British business newspaper, uh, that was given by the person who was then the head of the Nigerian Central Bank. Uh, he is actually the emir of Kano, one of the states of Nigeria. His specialty is Islamic law. I really don't know how he became a central banker. But in any case, he was interviewed and asked about what role China was playing in Africa. And he made the allegation that China is involved in deindustrializing Africa. And this is part of an uh, overall impetus toward Chinese neo-colonialism in the continent. But this kind of claim is based on a very narrow range of evidence. And the evidence basically involves only one industry in Africa, and that's the textile and clothing industry. The textile and clothing industry uh, has existed in many countries in Africa, but the evidence that's been brought forward in this regard has mostly involved Nigeria or South Africa. Um, what the claim made with regard to deindustrializing from China as a result of many Chinese textile and clothing exports entering the African market uh, does is it ignores the fact that African governments have played a large role in terms of determining the policy toward the textile and clothing industry. That is, they have preferred to obtain the rents that can be gotten uh, through taxation of imports coming in from China rather than concentrating on developing their own textile and clothing sector. Uh, in addition, 
they have ignored the evidence provided by a very fine econometrician uh, in South Africa, uh, which shows that even if manufacturing of textiles and clothing have declined as a result of the influx of goods from China and other parts of Asia, nevertheless, there has been a huge boom in terms of the retailing of textiles, clothing, and uh, other imports from China, uh, which has served to counteract the decline in manufacturing employment by a huge boost in terms of retail employment. And uh, that means that overall, in terms of employment, China ha uh, has actually provided a benefit uh, to uh, Africa, even if the benefit has not been immediately uh, in the manufacturing sector in that one industry. Now, in terms of background to discuss the question of whether uh, China is contributing to the industrialization of Africa, one has to consider what role is China playing in terms of investment in the world at large and in Africa particularly. And the two salient facts, I think, to know about that is that the role has been hugely exaggerated. That is, the amount of Chinese uh, outward foreign direct investment to the world is still quite small, especially in terms of the stock of investment overall. I provided some figures and proportions here which uh, compare China to other countries. In addition, uh, China, um, China's share in terms of investment, the stock of investment and the flow of investment to Africa has also been hugely exaggerated in the media. That is, while Chinese investment to Africa is important, it is by no means dominant in the African continent. And again, uh, a raft of figures for you to see. Uh, also, uh, China's OFDI uh, doesn't go to the poorest governed countries in Africa, contrary to the common conception, but rather mainly to politically stable countries and to places where skills are abundant. In addition, the gap between uh, Chinese investment in Africa and the investment of the traditional investors in the African continent, that is Britain, France, and the United States, is not being closed. That is, the flow of investment from China is still very significantly less than the flow of investment from these traditional investors. Um, one difference, though, is that uh, Chinese investment to Africa it tends to be now in different sectors than that of the traditional investors. By and large, the traditional investors are still very much concentrated in investment in natural resources. 90% of the investment from the traditional Western investors goes to natural resource extraction from Africa. But this is not the case with uh, Chinese investment. Extractive industry is still quite important, but construction and manufacturing uh, combined are even more important, and the proportion in construction and manufacturing is growing day by day. Chinese investment in Africa is pretty much stereotyped as uh, state-owned enterprise investment. And of course, there's a great deal of that, but there is also a great deal now of private the owned in, uh, enterprises investing in Africa. They are just concentrated in two different areas. As you can see, the majority of projects in Africa by Chinese companies are now done by POEs rather than SOEs, but the stock of investment by POEs is still rather small because of the difference in the sectors in which Chinese companies, whether they're SOEs on the one hand or POEs on the other hand, invest so that SOEs are mainly in construction, the large-scale infrastructure projects, and in mining, POEs are the main companies doing manufacturing and logistics. Well, um, infrastructure building is certainly the prerequisite uh, to the industrialization of Africa. 
And um, there has been, of course, a great concentration on the part of Chinese companies uh, in infrastructure building. And uh, this is particularly important with questions touching on uh, transport and logistics and building Africa's power grid. Uh, because in Africa, uh, the cost of transportation is huge uh, compared to other parts of the world. Uh, I guess I don't have the figures in this PowerPoint. But uh, I think on, on average, the cost of transporting goods is about two and a half times what it is in the United States. That is to move things along the roads and through the ports of Africa. So Chinese companies have been very much involved in the construction of railways, roads, uh, ports, etc. Also, of course, many contributions in terms of developing uh, the power grids of Africa. So it still has not resulted in any kind of revolution in costs of production in Africa. Uh, it is still very much the case that the costs of production in Africa are much higher uh, than in other parts of the world, uh, including in China itself. But some headway is being made in that regard. Uh, in part, the slow progress is because of very difficult conditions to actually create new infrastructure. Uh, in part, it's also because African governments have a very limited ability to put up financing uh, for these kind of projects. They spend uh, the lowest proportion of their budgets on infrastructure building compared to other parts of the world. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, Chinese companies now tend to be favored in terms of infrastructure building, favored by African governments particularly, is of course that they have a low hurdle rate. That is, they are willing to accept a much lower rate of profit in their construction projects than are companies coming from other parts of the world. So if you go back 30 years ago in Africa, uh, it was mostly German and Italian and French companies building infrastructure. That is certainly no longer the case because typically Western firms expect somewhere between 25% and 35% profit on infrastructure projects, whereas Chinese companies are happy to accept 5 to 10%. That's still higher than what they would typically obtain in China itself. Now, in these infrastructure projects, of course, if one just consults the Western media, you would have the view that um, it is Chinese coming from China exclusively uh, to build these projects and then going back. But that is certainly not the case. Uh, I've been involved in a project uh, to study localization of Chinese enterprises in Africa. We produced a database with over 800 Chinese companies and projects in Africa and found that the localization rate is in the mid 80 percent in terms of local workers being hired uh, in Chinese uh, owned enterprises across the board. That's in all the different sectors. Um, it is expected that uh, there will be a larger and larger proportion of Chinese companies involved very directly in manufacturing in Africa. In part that's because the price of the commodities that uh, Africa sells to the world uh, has declined in recent years, which meant uh, that there is less money around for the large-scale infrastructure projects, and therefore uh, Chinese companies' uh, proportion of contribution uh, that comes from building infrastructure in Africa compared to the other sectors will decline, and the proportion for manufacturing will increase. Uh, that doesn't mean that China is going to become anytime soon the main foreign country involved in manufacturing uh, in Africa. Uh, it is still the case, as you can see, that the traditional investors in Africa have the bulk of manufacturing plant. But uh, the gap between them and China is, and China is closing fairly rapidly. Because China, of course, is the new kid on the block in this regard. Uh, it's only been around in terms of manufacturing in Africa for the last 15 to 20 years. Well, there is some division in terms of uh, the participation of Chinese SOEs and Chinese POEs in the manufacturing sector. 
SOEs, by and large, are involved in heavy industry, uh, and POEs mostly involved in production of construction materials, electronic goods, and, of course, household items. SOEs are now uh, doing a lot of their manufacturing in special uh, economic zones. Uh, POEs are now doing it in industrial parks. And a recent study has shown that about 61% of all the new greenfield investment in Africa by Chinese companies in recent years, about 61% of the jobs produced are in manufacturing. And this, of course, is very important because in African societies, the formal sector is still very small. Most African countries have a formal sector involving 10% or less of the working population. So manufacturing, of course, provides uh, some hope for the expansion of the formal sector in that regard. Also, the Chinese government uh, has been involved in the building of um, human capital in Africa that is related to industrialization, particularly the expansion of regional vocational educational centers and various uh, capacity building colleges in Africa. So the plan now is to train about 200,000 Africans at a single time once this whole apparatus of vocational centers is established and thereby uh, produce the skilled workers who are needed uh, to work for Chinese companies that are involved in construction, manufacturing, and other sectors in Africa. In addition, about 40,000 students will be going uh, to China itself for training uh, to be skilled workers and technicians. Of course, there have long been African students studying in China, and the number of scholarships offered uh, has been radically increased in the last year or so. In addition, uh, at the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation meeting that occurred at the end of last year, China, for the very first time, announced that it would devote itself, in terms of its policy toward Africa, to the industrialization of the continent. Probably the first statement being made by a major country in the world in that regard. Of course, it remains to be seen how fully that will develop, uh, but uh, just the fact that the statement was made constitutes a kind of step forward. Now, there are some problems that, are, of course, are associated with China's involvement in Africa's industrialization. Uh, Chinese companies in Africa do some of the same things wrong uh, that companies from all over the world have done in Africa. Uh, first of all, uh, they are part of the general neoliberal project uh, in the world, which has tremendously adversely affected uh, many of the countries of Africa. And uh, while China didn't invent this policy, China doesn't fully practice neoliberalism at home, nevertheless, it is imbricated in the entire neoliberal project and therefore uh, it will not do anything which will probably lessen the high degree of inequality that exists in African society, even if it makes a contribution to Africa's industrialization. So that is certainly one problem. Also, there are some problems that are not general problems, but are rather specific to Chinese investment in Africa. Uh, one of the problems that Chinese enterprises encounter is that, by and large, the, these enterprises are the relatively marginal ones uh, in African economy as a whole. As the latecomer to Africa, a lot of the assets which Chinese companies acquired, not just mines, but other kinds of assets, tend to be the more marginal assets. And so they have problems with productivity, they have problems with profitability. And given those problems, Chinese companies either have to sustain losses, and they sustain much greater losses than companies coming from other parts of the world, or they have to find some way to make a profit which involves doing some things which uh, Africans may find objectionable. For example, paying lower wages than other foreign investors do. And that uh, certainly was a problem 
uh, up until the end of the last decade. There has been some closing of the gap in that regard in more recent times, but it is still the case uh, that uh, Chinese companies have a reputation of being relatively low-wage payers. Also, many Chinese companies have not been very effective in terms of communication uh, with people in Africa, not only with their own employees, but with a more general society. In part, this is the result of the fact that lots of Chinese who go to Africa are managers and engineers who don't have any experience internationally. They may only speak Chinese, not be able to speak any of the European languages common in Africa, let alone the local languages. But again, this is gradually changing. Of course, more and more people from China have become uh, fluent not only in English, but other European languages that are relevant to Africa, like uh, French or Portuguese. And uh, there certainly is an effort on the part of the smaller wholesale and retail commercial sector of Chinese in Africa to uh, learn to communicate effectively with their suppliers and customers, etc. In fact, in that regard, they do better uh, than the expats from the Western world. Uh, there are some, of course, rather striking cultural differences between uh, Chinese and Africans, although they culturally have some things in common. A particularly uh, desire to do some things more collectively than is done in other parts of the world, uh, respect for the family, education, etc. But still, compared to uh, the people from the traditional investing countries in Africa, they don't have the very significant cultural uh, similarity in terms of language, uh, religion, etc. So uh, Africans know Europeans quite well. They know Americans quite well as, well as well because, of course, of the spread of American culture throughout the world. They know Chinese culture much less, but uh, again, the gap is gradually closing. Uh, in addition, uh, Chinese seldom know how to respond uh, to the generally politically motivated attacks on the Chinese presence in several African countries. Uh, the Parties in opposition in several African countries have made the Chinese presence into an issue. And in part, this is uh, just for political gain on their part, because the ruling parties, parties of government in Africa, tend to be very friendly to uh, China. So uh, for political gain, uh, the opposition parties will often attack the Chinese presence. And Chinese living in Africa and working in Africa don't know how to effectively respond to that. And again, this has been a gradual learning process on their part. Um, they also don't know how to respond effectively to the distortions about the Chinese role in Africa that appear in the Western media. And there have been several uh, important studies of Western media in this regard, all of them showing that uh, Western media descriptions of the interaction between Africa and China have been highly distorted, biased, and often very ignorant. Uh, of course, our role as scholars is to do something to correct that, and the bulk of scholars in the world who've devoted themselves to studying the interface of China and Africa have made some great contributions in that regard. Uh, so Chinese um, adaption in Africa uh, has been increasing over the years. It's been still a very short period of time for the substantial Chinese presence in the continent. Again, only about 15 to 20 years. But uh, there still are limits to the benefits that Africans can derive from China participating in the industrialization of Africa. And uh, these benefits uh, are limited in part because, of course, uh, China is interested in the whole world now, and the One Belt, One Road initiative is not mainly concentrated on Africa, although Africa will play a significant role in it. So given China's interest in the whole world, uh, Africa can only hope to get a fairly small slice of that. Uh, and if it gets that small slice of that, that still probably will be, in an overall sense, beneficial to both parties, but it still has to be borne in mind that if Africa is going to industrialize, even if it gets some help from China, it is still going to have to mainly res resort to self-help. 
That is, it's still going to mainly have to industrialize based upon its own efforts, because there are few parts of the world uh, where industrialization has taken place as a result, mainly, of investment from overseas. So uh, we can expect that as the One Belt, One Road initiative develops in the future, you will hear more and more about the Chinese presence in Africa and the role that China uh, may play in terms of industrialization. But uh, it is certainly a, going to be a long-term process, not a matter of years, uh, maybe not even a matter of decades, but perhaps a matter of uh, centuries. Uh, and uh, over that period of time, one can expect a huge amount of activity in this interface, and that will present op interesting opportunities all around. Thanks very much. Thank you to both speakers. I would now like to invite both speakers to um, take seats. On my right, uh, we have about 12 or 13 minutes for question and answer. I would uh, politely like to request all questioners to keep their questions as brief as possible, and likewise for the respondents. And if you could, please introduce yourself very briefly before asking your question. So maybe I could take the moderator's prerogative and uh, start by asking a question. Um, in your presentation, Barry, you um, talked about, uh, you compared uh, China's role in Africa vis-a-vis uh, -vis the traditional um, investors, superpowers, the colonialists, the British, the Americans, and the other colonialists. Um, how do you square that with the fact that you're comparing a group of countries with just one, which is China? Yeah, well, of course, um, if you just look at, for example, investment figures, then uh, one could take the whole group of Western countries and compare it uh, to the level of investment from China. But even if you take each one of these countries separately, it is still the case that uh, the level of Chinese investment trails behind that of the traditional investors. So, of course, one could do it either way in terms of comparisons. And I don't think it would make much of a difference because in the end, it would still be the case that China has a lot of catching up to do in terms not only of uh, the investment that it's done so far, but even in terms of projected investment. So if you look at the flow of investment in recent years, it is such that the gap between China and the other investors is not closing. Uh, contrary to what the common conception is. And again, if you look at it in terms of the whole group of non-Chinese investors, or you look at it in terms of individual countries, again, the gap is not necessarily closing, although uh, the gap in particular sectors may be closing. And that's perhaps what's most important in considering matters like the potential uh, for Chinese contribution in terms of industrialization. Yes. I am uh, Alexander. I work in the aviation industry. So I have a question for, particularly for Alicia. So Hong Kong has been known for a maritime and air transportation center. And indeed, we are increasingly rely on the air transportation in driving our trade or supporting the trade. So how do you see the one belt, one road development would affect Hong Kong's growth in these kind of activities, for instance, like air, tra air transportation or in general? Um, well, I, I really don't know, but I mean, as an economist, it boils down to the following. If the rest of the world increases efficiency in other means of transportation, be it railway or road, or even increases efficiency in their own uh, aircraft transportation, uh, goods transportation, that's bad news for Hong Kong. <laughs> it's very simple. So this is why I think we need to come think out of the box to for Hong Kong to develop other means of supporting the Belt and Road, even you know, the usual current, uh, um, current advantages. 
uh, because that's what my analysis boils down to. That others really, you know, can do it directly. That's that's what it is. Uh, and and I think um, this is why for a God to follow what's going on and how it can find a niche in this project is uh, is absolutely essential. Yeah. Yeah, and one for just find the follow up. So you, you mentioned about the transportation cost by rail or road will be reduced by fifty percent. So in what type of time frame are you so referring to say in short run or I'll say up on twenty years time? No, the fifty percent is already has already happened. Happening. This is yes, I'm uh, I'm basically uh, um, this number comes from the bulletin, I mean the actually the card bulletin of the Chongqing Duisburg uh, line. And I'm generalizing that for the rest, that's all I'm doing, because I don't have other information. So that's real. Whether that is sustainable, because I kind of doubt that that's a real reduction in costs, how much is a subsidy uh, by that local government is, is really the question. Uh, the end, I mean, that's the question I would pose that local government to answer your question, but I don't know. Um, <clears throat> say that half of that is real, just for the sake of argument. Well, that's then you you reduce my numbers by half. Yeah, that's that's what it is. We don't really know. But the truth is that we are in a way missing the reality that many of these lines already exist. And I also know, talking to that local government with my co-author, a Chinese co-author, that those trains come empty from Europe. So Europe is not yet reaping these benefits that I just showed you, because those exports are not happening yet. But the reality is that that reduction in transportation is for the, for the coming back, I mean, for, for the returning trains. So, so we, and I was very impressed to see that, that uh, on the way back from Europe to you know, uh, East, that's when the tariffs go down by 50%. Yeah, that's uh, what we were shown, whether that is always the case or not. I really can't tell you because this is micro data, you know. But it, it's interesting. It, it shows that they're making an effort to use the railway uh, transportation massively. And I think the world is missing this picture because any expert in transportation will tell you, wow, maritime transportation will never be substituted. It's so, so much more efficient. I mean, you know this better than I. But maybe for some goods it will maybe for some kind of goods. Uh, and that's for what we need to explore, yeah? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Alicia, for a great talk. Uh, Edith Terry, Coventry Advisors. Uh, Alicia, uh, also a Hong Kong question. Um, you talk about Hong Kong uh, being, needing to restructure its financial industries in order to take advantage of this the, the opportunity for this intermediation of the five trillion. What exactly do you need? So if I look at the uh, bank's balance sheets in Hong Kong, it boils down to mortgages and loans to Chinese corporates. That's what I see. I don't know what you see, but that's what I see there. And I should see something else. I should see project finance in Indonesia. I should see, you know, uh, home funding in Pakistan. I should see uh, energy financing. I mean, that's what I should see in these balance sheets to make this happen. And then um, the, the bond market, you know, we have uh, uh, been some bond market, as you know, been, I would say, substituted by the private bond market, but of course, you know, doing pretty uh, poorly this year, even last year. Uh, the, the dollar denominated one is doing slightly better, but it's very small. I mean, China's uh, bond market, onshore bond market, is what ten times bigger. I mean, so, in a way, Hong Kong is not following China's pace in in deepening its financial markets in its cross-border sense. Yeah, I mean, like uh, being a finance platform for for cross-border deals. It's mainly China-driven or domestically-driven, yeah, for the mortgage part. So that's what I mean. I mean, bond market, I, I don't think the equity part, which has been 
have been very successful will, will be the answer to this question because we're thinking financing, you know, of infrastructure uh, uh, projects. So it's basically bond, uh, PPP type, uh, lending, that's what it is, bank lending, CF, um, that's what it is. I'd like to jump in. What, what do you think is the, are the reasons for that non-deepening, for that deepening not occurring? Is it because Hong Kong banks don't have the expertise, they're worried about the credit risk, they, they don't uh, have the history of doing this, or a combination of these? Okay, so I worked in a bank for 10 years, no, for nine years, if to the bank in Hong Kong, and I think the, I mean, my impression, although I just write reports, so I'm not the right person to ask that question, but, um, not reports, I mean, but my feeling is that it was too easy. You know, like they have these uh, Chinese corporates out there uh, asking for financing. It was like a kind of an implicit guarantee, the life of the motherland. And it was easy and nice. But now the question is, because it was so easy and nice, did you miss this huge opportunity? And I, I don't think you basically missed it all. It's still there, yeah? I'm just arguing that there's so much more money needed that it's only a question of appetite. But the whole country should move very fast in in uh, coming with new instruments for infrastructure financing. That, that's Thank what you. I would do. Thank you. More questions from the floor, please. Yes. Professor Lee. I'm Joseph Lee from uh, HKUSK. Uh, uh, can you comment on the investment of other countries like Korea in Africa? Because if one goes to that city, they always see well, of course, there is uh, investment by other countries, uh, apart from the traditional investors on the one hand and China on the other. Uh, most of the attention has been focused now on investment coming from India. Turkey and Brazil. Uh, of course, there is a, a modicum of Korean investment, uh, a modicum of Russian investment in Africa, but they're still very far behind um, the other countries, which I just mentioned, in terms of developing countries that have been investing in Africa. Um, there still is a very major gap between China, on the one hand, and those other developing countries. Those other developing countries, on the whole, are even more newcomers than China is, because uh, China has a relatively long history of at least some large-scale infrastructure projects that were given as aid to Africa uh, during the socialist period in China, the Tazara Railway, for example, Tanzania-Zambia Railway. Um, those other countries that I just mentioned don't have that kind of history, don't have that kind of experience. But at least with the, in, in the case of India and Brazil, they do have some advantages in having fairly large uh, diaspora of co-ethnics or people who speak the same language as them in the former Portuguese colonies, in the case of Brazil. Indians, of course, uh, ethnic Indians are scattered in many parts of Africa, so that provides an advantage which Chinese didn't have because, of course, the Chinese, uh, overseas Chinese population, the Huachao population in Africa is still very small and most uh, Chinese in Africa still have the idea that they are Hua Chao and they will return to China at some point. So uh, in terms of the hierarchy of investment, one can say that um, the traditional investors are still on top and still a huge gap between them and China. Um, and the others uh, from the developing world are coming up fast uh, acquiring a lot of experience in various African settings and in different sectors. And they perhaps, in some respects, can rival China in some of those sectors. Okay, one last question from the gentleman in the back. Or depending on how, how brief the question is, maybe we can fit into. Uh, Alan Parrett, I'm a core investor 
with one of the biggest state enterprises in the auto industry in, in the Europe. And I really question whether or not this actually helps. For it seems to me that manufacturing is moving back to the West. If your target market is the West, you need to be manufacturing in or very close to it. That is certainly true of the auto industry. If you walk into Zara in London, it's for Portuguese or Turkish made products. And we are basically sourcing our manufacturing our products in the market. So we're building a new plant in Mexico, chuck it up to the Texas border, into Tennessee, Kentucky, all in a day. Uh, we have that's the nature of it. So I, I really question the sort of fundamental behind this. Uh, the term I would use is truckability, ability to truck a product within 24 hours to the, to the ultimate destination. Uh, just, I have a question about the whole purpose of the best Phase if the, the production chain uh, evolved in the direction you just described. Say that uh, we go back to a very you know more concentrated concentrated production chain and a lot of that is producing you say say we go back to that. But where's the final demand? Where's the final demand? So you still have to move shift those things. So maybe you know. Georgian uh, guy will make his money back. Uh, bring, I mean, the direction could be the opposite, and then he raise the tariff. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why the fact that uh, production may go back to Europe will excite that you can to consume it. Maybe not. Maybe you know, if you find find other places to to sell that automobiles, and then you need uh, the transportation. So I, I don't know why that's uh, contradictory. That's that's the point. I think it's the production and then you know, where's the final demand. I think there are many countries in that belt and road that may look, uh, they may appear to have low purchasing power today, uh, but will not have low purchasing power forever. And that's, the, that's why it's a 20 year game. One final question from the gentleman in the front picture. My name is Tony Tong from Tony Company from USA. Uh, one thing I want to ask that I mean, the Chinese investor has spent um, billions and billions of dollars over, um, over the in infrastructure. Right? So, from the business point of view, what are the benefits to, the, to, to those um, Chinese investors? And how long that they can earn the money or take a profit from this project? This is because of the solution. Besides political I know that there are some But on the business point of view, how long this project will be, will be um, break even and, and, and for those uh, Chinese investors can, can they take profit? Well, I haven't studied uh, Chinese investment in the whole world, of course, in that regard, but I can tell you that in the African setting, uh, profit-making by Chinese these companies that are involved in infrastructure is one of the more reliable uh, forms of profit taking uh, in the sense that of course infrastructure building is often based upon loans that are provided uh, by Chinese banks and these are often of course the the public banks uh, the policy banks of China and the money is not paid uh, through, for example, African governments, uh, but rather goes directly to the Chinese companies involved in the infrastructure building. And therefore, uh, they don't have the kind of political risk or the risk that uh, entails dealing with the local corrupt regimes that uh, one might typically expect, and that's often been the case in the past. So I think for Chinese companies involved in infrastructure building in Africa, at least, it is something that is not only for the present in terms of um, almost guaranteed profitability, but something for the long term. And that's why uh, many Chinese companies that are involved in infrastructure building in Africa 
have uh, not only established themselves in a single country, but spread out throughout the entire continent um, based upon experience accumulated in one country after another and based upon the expectation that whatever project that they're going to be involved in, they're going to be paid on it and perhaps not, being, not be paid as handsomely as the Western companies might ex have expected in the past, but nevertheless, um, having that expectation firmly in mind. And so they are planning for many decades to come to be involved in that sector. Maybe just to reflect on, on two things, which are absolutely related. Um, excess capacity in China, I mean, I show steel, but Jetro, for example, Japanese um, lobby, uh, whatever, uh, industrial uh, lobby, has estimates which are very close to 50, i.e. out of two units, you sell one in those over capacity sectors, whatever that might be. If, if you go to Africa, this, re, this would uh, basically imply that as long as you have more than one chance out of two to be paid, <laughs> you're fine. That's what it means. So you don't need a huge expected profit to go there. And if your objectives, uh, five year plan and you know, trickle down to your company, are that you these are actually on size of you know, how much you expand your production, and increasingly maybe less offers and over capacity sectors, but quite true generally, then you may as well go. And, re and the last figure is return on assets in China has gone down. You know, we have uh, IMF figures uh, showing that it's actually the lowest in the, in the emerging world by region, uh, below 1.5%. So that's what it is. So those 5% profits that you were showing actually look pretty interesting, yeah? no matter the country risk, because your profitability at home is so low. So that's, that pushes people out. Yeah? That pushes companies out. Yeah, just let me add one sentence, and that is that um, apart from earning profit, there's also earning experience. And lots of Chinese companies involved in infrastructure building get tremendous experience overseas. Of course, the kind of experience that you get in Africa might not be that readily transferable uh, if you're then going to build a project in, say, the United States or Belgium. But a lot of it is. And actually, a, a lot of the people who go as engineers, particularly or managers, to Africa uh, to participate in Chinese infrastructure building end up being sent to not just Central Asia, uh, but to the US or Canada or Europe or Australia. Uh, and the experience that they've accumulated there has been extremely valuable to the development of their companies. OK, with that, I'd like to draw this uh, panel discussion to a close. I'd like to end by um, thanking the audience to brave this weather. I'd like to thank our supporters, EY, and not least, I'd like to thank the speakers for their insights. A round of applause.